ten books for ten minutes for ten days. Book five. Part one. Robe and ring. We must, by law, keep a record of the innocents we kill, and, as I see it, they're all innocents, even the guilty. Everyone is guilty of something, and everyone still harbors a memory of childhood innocence, no matter how many layers of life wrap around it. Humanity is innocent, humanity is guilty, and both states are undeniably true. We must, by law, keep a record. It begins on day one of apprenticeship. But we do not officially call it killing. It's not socially or morally correct to call it such. It is, and has always been, gleaning, named for the way the poor would trail behind farmers in ancient times, taking the stray stalks of grain left behind. It was the earliest form of charity. A scythe's work is the same. Every child is told from the day he or she is old enough to understand that the scythes provide a crucial service for society. Ours is the closest thing to a sacred mission the modern world knows. Perhaps that is why we must, by law, keep a record. A public journal, testifying to those who will never die, and those who are yet to be born, as to why we human beings do the things we do. We are instructed to write down not just our deeds, but our feelings, because it must be known that we do have feelings, remorse, regret, sorrow too great to bear, because if we didn't feel those things, what monsters would we be? From the Gleaning Journal of H. S. Curie Chapter 1 No Dimming of the Sun The scythe arrived late on a cold November afternoon, Citra was at the dining-room table, slaving over a particularly difficult algebra problem, shuffling variables, unable to solve for X or Y, when this new and far more pernicious variable entered her life's equation. Guests were frequent at the Terranova's apartment, so when the doorbell rang there was no sense of foreboding, no dimming of the sun, no foreshadowing of the arrival of death at their door. Perhaps the universe should have deigned to provide such warnings, but scythes were no more supernatural than tax collectors, in the grand scheme of things. They showed up, did their unpleasant business, and were gone. Her mother answered the door. Citra didn't see the visitor, as he was, at first, hidden from her view by the door when it opened. What she saw was how her mother stood there, suddenly immobile, as if her veins had solidified within her. As if, were she tipped over, she would fall to the floor and shatter. May I enter, Mrs. Terranova? The visitor's tone of voice gave him away, resonant and inevitable, like the dull tone of an iron bell, confident in the ability of its peal to reach all those who needed reaching. Citra knew before she even saw him that it was a scythe. My God! A scythe has come to our home. Yes, yes, of course, come in. Citra's mother stepped aside to allow him entry, as if she were the visitor and not the other way around. He stepped over the threshold, his soft, slipper-like shoes making no sound on the parquet floor. His multi-layered robe was smooth, ivory linen, and although it reached so low as to dust the floor, there was not a spot of dirt on it anywhere. A scythe, Citra knew, could choose the color of his or her robe, every color except for black, for it was considered inappropriate for their job. Black was an absence of light, and scythes were the opposite, luminous and enlightened. They were acknowledged as the very best of humanity, which is why they were chosen for the job. Some scythe robes were bright, some more muted, they looked like the rich flowing robes of Renaissance angels, both heavy yet lighter than air. The unique style of Scythe's robes, regardless of the fabric and color, made them easy to spot in public, which made them easy to avoid if avoidance was what a person wanted. Just as many were drawn to them. The color of the robe often said a lot about a Scythe's personality. 
This scythe's ivory robe was pleasant, and far enough from true white not to assault the eye with its brightness. But none of this changed the fact of who and what he was. He pulled off his hood to reveal neatly cut gray hair, a mournful face red-cheeked from the chilly day, and dark eyes that seemed themselves almost to be weapons. Citra stood, not out of respect, but out of fear. Shock. She tried not to hyperventilate. She tried not to let her knees buckle beneath her. They were betraying her by wobbling, so she forced fortitude to her legs, tightening her muscles. Whatever the scythe's purpose here, he would not see her crumble. You may close the door, he said to Citra's mother, who did so, although Citra could see how difficult it was for her. A scythe in the foyer could still turn around if the door was open. The moment that door was closed, he was truly, truly inside one's home. He looked around, spotting Citra immediately. He offered a smile. Hello, Citra, he said. The fact that he knew her name froze her just as solidly as his appearance had frozen her mother. Don't be rude, her mother said too quickly. Say hello to our guest. Good day, Your Honor. Hi, said her younger brother, Ben, who had just come to his bedroom door, having heard the deep peal of the scythe's voice. Ben was barely able to squeak out the one-word greeting. He looked to Citra and to their mother, thinking the same thing they were all thinking. Who has he come for? Will it be me? Or will I be left to suffer the loss? I smelled something inviting in the hallway, the scythe said, breathing in the aroma. Now I see I was right in thinking it came from this apartment. Just baked ziti, your honor. Nothing special. Until this moment, Citra had never known her mother to be so timid. That's good, said the scythe, because I require nothing special. Then he sat on the sofa and waited patiently for dinner. Was it too much to believe that the man was here for a meal, and nothing more? After all, scythes had to eat somewhere. Customarily, restaurants never charged them for food, but that didn't mean a home-cooked meal was not more desirable. There were rumors of scythes who required their victims to prepare them a meal before getting gleaned. Is that what was happening here? Whatever his intentions, he kept them to himself, and they had no choice but to give him whatever he wanted. Will he spare a life here today if the food is to his taste? Citra wondered. No surprise that people bent over backward to please scythes in every possible way. Hope in the shadow of fear is the world's most powerful motivator. Citra's mother brought him something to drink, at his request, and now labored to make sure tonight's dinner was the finest she had ever served. Cooking was not her specialty. Usually she would return home from work just in time to throw something quick together for them. Tonight their lives might just rest on her questionable culinary skill. And their father? Would he be home in time? Or would a gleaning in his family take place in his absence? As terrified as Citra was, she did not want to leave the scythe alone with his own thoughts, so she went into the living room with him. Ben, who was clearly as fascinated as he was fearful, sat with her. The man finally introduced himself as Honorable Scythe Faraday. I, uh, did a report on Faraday for school once, Ben said, his voice cracking only once. You picked a pretty cool scientist to name yourself after. Scythe Faraday smiled. I like to think I chose an appropriate patron historic. Like many scientists, Michael Faraday was underappreciated in his life, yet our world would not be what it is without him. I think I have you in my scythe card collection, Ben went on. I have almost all the mid-American scythes, but you are younger in the picture. The man seemed perhaps sixty, and although his hair had gone gray, his goatee was still salt and pepper. It was rare for a person to let themselves reach such an age before resetting back to a more youthful self. Citra wondered how old he truly was. How long had he been charged with ending lives? Do you look your true age, or are you at the far end of time by choice? Citra asked. Citra! Her mother nearly dropped the casserole she had just taken out of the oven. What a question to ask! 
I like direct questions, the scythe said. They show an honesty of spirit, so I will give an honest answer. I admit to having turned the corner four times. My natural age is somewhere near 180, although I forget the exact number. Of late I have chosen this venerable appearance because I find that those I glean take more comfort from it. Then he laughed. <laughs> they think me wise. Is that why you're here? Ben blurted. To glean one of us? Scythe Faraday offered an unreadable smile. I'm here for dinner. And that, children, is all you get.